The scripture lesson is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Syria. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Syria. A truly great man, but afflicted with a grievous skin disease, leprosy. It so happened that the Syrians, on one of its raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria, he would be healed of his skin disease. Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well, then go, said the king of Syria, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So he went off, taking with him about 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, When you get this letter, you'll know that I've personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset, ripping his robe to pieces. He said, am I a god with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight, that's what. Elisha, the man of God, heard what had happened, that the king of Israel was so distressed that he'd ripped his robe to shreds. He sent word to the king, why are you so upset ripping your robe like this? Send him to me so he'll learn that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman, with his horses and chariots, arrived in style and stopped at Elisha's door. Elisha sent out a servant to meet him with this message. Go to the river Jordan and immerse yourself seven times. Your skin will be healed and you'll be as good as new. Naaman lost his temper. He turned on his heel saying, I thought he'd personally come out and meet me. Call in the name of God wave his hand over the the diseased spot and get rid of the disease. The Damascus River, Zabana and Farfar, are cleaner by far than any of the rivers in Israel. Why not bathe in them? I'd at least get clean. He stomped off, mad as a hornet. But his servant caught up with him and said, Father, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard and heroic, wouldn't you have done it? So why not this simple wash and be clean? So he did it. He went down and immersed himself in the Jordan seven times, following the orders of the holy man. His skin was healed. It was like the skin of a little baby. He was as good as new. He then went back to Elisha the prophet, he and his entourage, stood before him and said, I now know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no God anywhere on earth other than the God of Israel. In gratitude, let me give you a gift. As God lives, Elisha replied, the God whom I serve, I'll take nothing from you. Naaman tried his best to get him to take something, but he wouldn't do it. If you won't take anything, said Naaman, let me ask you for something. Give me a load of dirt, as much as a team of donkeys can carry, because I'm never again going to worship any God other than God. But there's one thing for which I need God's pardon. When my master, leaning on my arm, enters the shrine of Rimon and prays and worships there, and I'm with him there, worshiping Rimon, may you see to it that God forgives me for this. Elisha said, everything will be all right. Go in peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Shirley. And would you join with me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, help us now as we think about this sacred story. And I pray that you would guide our thoughts and guide mine too. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have to confess that I really wrestle with my feelings of entitlement. Entitlement means that I deserve certain perks and privileges and luxuries because, well, basically, I'm me. Like the better parking places and, you know, the 
the things that really make you feel good. But we all feel entitled to some degree or another. We have been all raised to believe that life will always get better for us, that we should never have to suffer, that we deserve the best education, the highest salary right out of the gate, the most convenient parking spaces. I once knew the guy who assigned all the parking spaces in Washington, D.C., and he had godlike status, actually. He got a lot of perks. But we want that, and a trouble-free life, and um, un unlimited, unhampered lifestyle, and those special little things that we like because we're special. You know, I've spoken to a lot of people who didn't feel very special after getting things like cancer, and they were angry, red-hot angry. They said, how can I believe in a God who would give people cancer? You know, and they'd get really angry at people who tried to help them, doctors, nurses, their family members. They had to deal with things like chemotherapy and radiation and all those noxious side effects. No one deserves cancer, but cancer is a fact of life. I'd love it if we all had charmed lives. I, mean, I really would jump for joy if no one ever got cancer again. If no one ever again got hit by a drunk driver or came down with some dread disease. If our jobs were always guaranteed and the benefits would always get better and the governor would not take them away, we'd all cheer. But that's not our world, is it? That's just not how it is. So in our world, where we believe we are entitled, that's a dangerous thing. And entitlements can be a blessing, but entitlement can be a curse. So in the wisdom of our uh, Jewish forebearers, they believed that we needed this story of Naaman in the Bible. And the story invites us to rethink our grandiose expectations that come from our entitlements and invites us instead to gratitude, to trust in the God who meets us in the grit and the mud of ordinary life and moves us from our self-centered, privileged expectation to a posture of gratitude just simply for the gift of each day, of each breath. And in a world that sells us slogans like, have it your way. Remember that old saying that is a jingle from McDonald's, hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. You know, remember that? What was that, Burger King? I think it was, Mc it was Burger King. Well, I'm banned from McDonald's anyway, so. Instead, what we learn is a better saying, which is, not my will, but yours. So in this story, near, near, Naaman is a Syrian general. He's a very powerful figure. He's at the top of the pile. Only the king is more powerful. And they're in a regional superpower. And he had it all. And then he got leprosy, which is a wasting disease that he knew would grind his body down and leave him helpless. And no matter his position, his power, his pride, his wealth, his privilege, he's not going to beat this disease. And his doctors cannot help him. He has a death sentence. But a little Jewish girl, she is a captive that was taken in across the border raid to Israel. A raid where likely her parents and her family were slaughtered by his army. And she's brought as a slave with no privilege whatsoever. She says, if only my master would meet the prophet in Samaria, the prophet would heal him. And Mrs. Naaman hears that. And she goes straight to Naaman the general, who then goes to the king. And the king says, why are you feeling sorry for yourself? Go. Just go. And what he takes is so really interesting. He takes in current values 150 pounds of gold, 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold at $1,500 an ounce, and it might be higher, is about $3.6 million. And the silver is worth more than $400,000. Ten sets of clothing, clothing, I mean, is all handmade, so probably in our terms, tens of thousands of dollars. So more than $4 million, plus a small army of men. I guess health care has always had its high cost, even back then. And he travels to Samaria. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. They had a breakup after Solomon. And they had the northern kingdom, which had a capital in Samaria, and the southern kingdom, which its capital was Jerusalem. So he presents himself to the king of northern Israel. And he thinks perhaps this is the prophetic soul who will heal him, the one whom the slave girl spoke of. He's obviously a man of power and prestige, even though the Syrians have beaten the Israelis often. 
And the Israelite king has a panic attack. You know, what he sees is a setup for yet another war, and he always loses with these people. So he is really angry. He does all the typical Middle Eastern things, rips his clothes, goes crazy. And the prophet Elisha, he's the successor to Elijah. He says to the king, calm yourself. Have this man come to me. And then he'll know that there is a prophet of the living God in Israel. Now Naaman is used to a life of entitlement. He snaps his fingers and things happen. People jump. He has to humble himself. And he has to find the house of this prophet. But this isn't like in one of the nicer suburbs. It's not in the federal district where all the wealthy people live. He's not living, living in the mansion. He's living in a hovel. He's in austerity, practically poverty. And the general with his wagon train and the clothes and the silver and the gold and all those armed soldiers stand at his door. And the prophet doesn't even have decency to come out. Greet him. Tell him what to do. Wave his arms around and do all the things that he's expecting that a prophet should do. Instead, he sends out a messenger, really a servant, who says, the prophet says, go to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times, you'll be fine. What's this? No grand gestures. No people bowing in deference to him. You know, he has gone over the border more than once. He can do it again. Just an instruction to go to the river. George Patton slapped Soldier Silly for more than, less than that, rather. And you feel the impatience in this man growing. He says, what kind of stupid prophet is this? He won't even come out to me personally. A proper prophet, a real one would come and stand before me. He'd know who I am. He'd lay his hands over the leprosy. He'd call on his God. He'd do a proper job of it. There's no way I'm going to go to that poor excuse of a muddy creek for a river. They call that Jordan. Now, here's Naaman. He brought money. He brought a lot of money. And money isn't going to get what he needs. He brought his expectation that the prophet would honor him and treat him with all the deference he was entitled to receive because he did deserve special treatment after all. Instead, a servant says, go to a muddy creek and dip yourself seven times, you'll be fine. I mean, talk about disappointments. So let me ask, has God ever disappointed you? I mean, be honest, right? Have you ever had an expectation of God and God disappointed you? And I'm saying probably so. And I would tell you mine too. Confession is good for the soul. It's bad for the reputation. So I'll keep my mouth shut. Well, look, life is a risk. And you are not entitled to anything more than anyone else is. You know, no one has the lease on the next day or the next month or the next year. Not even the next breath. God does not owe you or me a thing. Not one thing. But we have our entitlements. So some years ago, when I was an associate pastor, we prayed for a 30-something mother of four kids who was moving into the last months of her life with breast cancer. And that group prayed mightily. They prayed persistently. In fact, that entire church rallied around that family. They brought them a meal for two years, every night, seven days a week, to help that family. They did anything they could, took her to her appointments, babysat the kids. I mean... We all did that. We all pitched in. And once in a prayer meeting, as they were moving towards those last stages, a member of the group earnestly exhorted everyone, probably 30 people in a circle, and said, if we pray harder and with all our might, if our lives are clean before God, then God just has to heal Pat. I know it. And a few months later, she passed away at 35, leaving her family behind. And the woman who exhorted everyone that day became so angry with God that she just walked away from God and the church. In fact, her family. It was sort of an interesting thing. She was so angry. What prayer of yours went unanswered to the point where you became angry at God for the silent treatment that God gave you? I bet more than a few of you can say, well, there was this time. You know, in this story, Naaman is not a paragon of faith. He has no faith at all. He's not even in the market for a new God. All he wanted was for the leprosy to go away so he could have his old life back again. 
And isn't that what we really want too? We don't want trials and troubles. We just want them to go away. You know, we resist, we complain, we groan our way through those things. We don't seem to grow. We just groan through our trials. And that is a part of this story that when we encounter God, the real God, there's some growth that has to take place. Naaman just wanted his old life back. He knew the gods and goddesses of the stories of his tradition. He knew that. They weren't able to help. He knew that too. His prayers were to dead gods. But what Elisha wanted was the process of Naaman to discover the God of all creation, who is sovereign and gracious, who will not be subject to the will of a man, not even a powerful man, not even a man with a lot of entitlements. He's just like everyone else. So in our story, Nathan, Na Naaman rather, leaves the prophet's house completely disgusted. And I'm sure that he said more than a few words you don't say in church. And as he left, his, his attendants come to him and they suggest that, well, you know, is it such a hard thing to do what the prophet said? I mean, really, I mean, if he wanted you to do something hard and heroic, you're the kind of guy who could do that sort of thing, but it's just a little thing. So what do you have to lose? And it wasn't that Naaman had great faith, he had great desperation. So he did it. He skinny dipped in the Jordan seven times. And when he comes up, his skin is smooth as, well, if you forgive the reference, a baby's backside. God surprises him with a gracious healing. Now, God didn't know Naaman a thing. A lot of people got leprosy and died. But God is gracious. And God loved Naaman as surely as God loves all of creation. So a greater thing than a healing from leprosy is going on here. It's the discovery that God is real and present in, the, in our life. And what we realize in this story, what our Jewish forebears had discovered long ago, is that God is always present in our lives. And that God seems to work best in the mud and the grit of our daily living. You know, if you look at this as a whole piece of cloth and you put it together, it yields so much for us. That here's a strong, rich, powerful man, a general, humbled by leprosy, a, sl a girl who becomes the means, a slave girl, by which her master will find some hope of healing. Naaman has to travel to a land he conquered, a land he has no respect for. And the king of Israel panics because there's no way he can see God. The God who brought his people up out of slavery, showing favor to a hated enemy. That just doesn't happen in his mind. And yet there in a muddy, poor excuse, creek for a river, God meets Naaman, and Naaman meets God. And Naaman discovers that God cares. It's a moment of pure grace, and God is all about grace. Grace is the undeserved love and favor that's divinely showered upon us. God doesn't owe you a thing, not even an explanation for your most difficult problems in life, but God delights in giving us grace all the same. And once you get past your need for entitlement, once you get beyond the notion that you're special and you deserve special treatment, once you understand that the struggle of life is not a bad thing, but actually a good thing, and it's the process that you go through where you grow. Then you discover the humility necessary to know God and to grow beyond yourself in this life. Now, you know, there's one largely ignored person in this story that holds the key to really understanding it. Her story tells the tale. This is the unnamed Jewish slave girl taken as a war captive. God knows what horror she saw in that. Her humanity and her dignity are denied her. She has no sense of entitlement and has no expectation of such, no notion that she's special. She's a captive, she's a slave, that's it. She asks for nothing, but she gives to Naaman a great gift. She trusts in the God of Israel. He treats her as a real person, and she knows no matter who treats her as what, 
Well, not at all. She knows that God cares for her. And she has one thing going for her. She knows how to look upward. And she knows that God loves her and God guides her and God always has. Because if she matters to no one else, she matters to God. The God who created her will always love her. And that's what she shared with Naaman. That was the real gift that he received. The healing from leprosy was a wonderful thing, but he was still going to get sick and he was still going to die. So the relationship that he received from God was the real gift. So much so that he said, listen, if I can't do anything else, give me a load of dirt so I can always remember Israel, the Holy Land. This is where God is. It changed the rest of his life. You know, the goal of faith is not to produce perfect people. It's not to produce people who can perform amazing acts or do wonderful things or great manifestations. It's not a faith that's supposed to produce people with correct beliefs and correct lives and correct behaviors. Besides, all those people want to do is correct other people. In this muddy, dirty, gritty life of ours, that's not possible or even desired. Instead, the goal of faith is to discover the love of God that humbles and changes us into people who care and love and live our lives caring for other people and accepting them as they are in the dirt and grit of this life in ways that our lives help heal the lives of those around us. And when you look at this story, that's the sacred story. Amen.